want you to imagine that you're a famous actor and you're about to step onto the Broadway stage. You've been performing the main character role in this show for the past few seasons, which means you know the plot, the dialogue, the song lyrics backwards and forwards. You even have an intimate relationship with every character in the show. You know the location of every prop on set, so much so that you can arrive on your mark with your eyes closed every time. You can easily describe the colors, the textures, the sensations of every prop you hold, and you're able to predict the exact moment. The crowd will roar with laughter or gasp with concern. But most importantly, you know who you share scenes with, what your future holds, where you're meant to be standing, when you're meant to speak, and why your character behaves the way they do. And then, this happens. The show's manuscript is shredded, and with it goes all the information you need to navigate the stage. That's exactly what happens to us in our grief. You see, our lives are built by the stories we tell of our experiences, and a death or some other devastating loss of ability, relationship, maybe traumatic event, it's akin to the manuscript of our lives being torn to shreds and then handed back to us with no instructions on how to rewrite it, on how to live our lives. And grief is the journey we're on as we rewrite and live into the emerging story of our lives. That metaphor, the shredded manuscript metaphor, it's one I developed years ago. I was a clinical social worker trained in narrative therapy. I'd spent nearly a decade working in foster care, adoption, family services, crisis intervention, which meant I was working with individuals and communities in deep grief. And yet, when I looked around at the stories and descriptions of grief in my own field, in our media, in this country, I suspected that they were limited and flat and misleading. But honestly, it wasn't until I went through my own personal year of hell that I truly began to understand the problem with our collective story of grief. After a year of watching my previously warm, kind, athletic young husband become someone neither he nor I recognized, after a year of asking questions of doctors and getting no answers, I found myself lying next to my 44-year-old husband as he died in my arms. Just two and a half weeks after discovering it had been a grapefruit-sized brain tumor all along. After Eric took his last breath, I somehow took my first breath without him, and I stood up, and I went home, and I told our seven-year-old daughter that her dad was dead. But it wasn't until I had to return to work two weeks later as clinical director that I truly began to understand the limitations of our grief story and how much harm that was causing my daughter and I, my clients, my friends, my family, well, all of us. As a widow, I was learning what it felt like to be unseen. As a therapist, I'd become a compassionate listener as the director and co-founder of nonprofits, I learned to be an advocate, an educator, a writer, a speaker. I knew I had some skills, and I knew I didn't want anyone else to suffer unnecessarily, the way my daughter and I had, the way my clients had. So I set out to become a grief activist. I started person by person to reduce harm, but People are suffering so much, and so my activism grew very quickly, from hosting a podcast to working with individuals and organizations as a writer, as a keynote speaker, even as professor of loss and grief in the School of Social Work right here at the University of Texas at Austin. As a grief activist, I am under no illusion that I can make grief easy. I really wish I could. But grief is hard. There's no way around that. Instead, my vision is to eliminate our unnecessary suffering and grief 
And to do that, I knew I needed to take on the biggest challenge getting in our way, our grief illiteracy. You see, we're grief illiterate because individually and collectively, we've only consumed a very narrow, limited, misleading, singular story of grief. In the West, our grief story goes something like this. Grief happens when someone you're close to dies. You feel sad, maybe angry, but only for a little while. Those feelings can last a while, let's say a few months, but again, only if you were close to that person. You mostly keep it to yourself. If you must, find a therapist or another group of grievers like you so that you don't get your grief on other people. You keep busy, you get back to work, you know, because it's good for you. And as soon as possible, you move in a neat and orderly fashion through the five stages of grief, like some sort of to-do list, and voila. If you've tried hard enough, if you're good enough, if you're strong enough, in about a year, you're done. And now you can move on. If you or anyone you know has experienced a profound loss, you know how untrue and complete that story is. So if we all know it, why does it persist? Why do we remain so grief illiterate? The simplified answer is that in our modern capitalistic, mostly secular society, We've built a culture with systems and institutions that values and rewards things like productivity over process, simplicity over complexity, destinations over journeys, we value stoicism over vulnerability, and the list goes on. And maybe you can start to see how those values reinforce that grief story. And instead of questioning our values or our systems, we end up questioning ourselves. For me, honestly, that looked like a whole lot of self-judgment and loathing for not being at the top of my work game when I was required to return two weeks after Eric's death. And the unreasonable pressure that we put on ourselves in the wake of loss comes at a steep cost to all of us, to our physical, to our mental, to our collective health and well-being, not just because as individuals we suffer unnecessarily, but it's because we inflict that suffering on other people. We do it at the individual level and at the institutional level by the misguided policies and systems we build and uphold. So now that we all know the problem with our grief story, we can't remain grief illiterate. But this is the point in my talk where I pause. And I remind all of you not to should on yourself for not knowing. I said should. Uh, it's not surprising that we're mostly grief illiterate. It's honestly practically in the air we breathe. Instead, I want to invite all of you to do something I ask my students to do at the start of each class. Arrive here. Take a deep breath in. Let it out. Return your awareness to this moment. Let go of wherever your mind has taken you and arrive back here for today's lesson. Now, I'm going to rely on the wisdom of my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Davis, to expand our stories of grief by breaking it down to the most important components. Who, what, where, when, and why. It's what I like to call the five W's of grief. Who experiences grief? Every single one of us. To be human is to tell a story of our lives that involves people, places, abilities, hopes, and dreams. And to be alive means some of those things will come to an end and some will never begin. As for who we grieve, it can be anyone or anything. Yes, we grieve the death of those that we loved, but we can also grieve the death of people we were estranged from ability or people who are no longer in our day-to-day -day lives. We can actually grieve the versions of ourselves that we were in the before, before the loss happened, and versions of ourselves we never got a chance to become in the after. The most important thing to remember is you can grieve anyone at any phase in their life and death, including versions of yourself.
Now, what do we grieve? Well, we grieve the known, the certain, the connection, and the meaning we've attached to the stories of our lives. Grief insists that we come to terms with what no longer is, or was, or will be. Grief takes on many forms, from anticipatory grief, the kind probably many of us have experienced in the wake of a loved one's terminal diagnosis, to all sorts of ambiguous losses, like the kind when someone is physically present but psychologically distant, maybe as in the case of Alzheimer's or addiction, honestly what I experienced when my husband quickly became unrecognizable, or the kind of loss where someone is physically distant but very much present in our hearts and minds, when someone's gone missing, maybe they're imprisoned, deployed, Actually, the full list of grief types fills the alphabet with things like complex and compounding grief, to disenfranchised grief, often resulting from systems of oppression, to traumatic grief, and the list goes on. But remember, whatever you're grieving, it's a normal response to loss. The explanation for where actually has two parts. Where does grief come from, meaning the source, and where does it go, meaning what does grief impact? While death loss is the most obvious source of our grief, we can grieve many types of losses, from the maturational phases of our lives, like leaving home for the first time or retirement, to unexpected accidents and upheavals, like catastrophic injuries, chronic illnesses, other life-limiting events. Other often missed sources of a grief include things we had a reason to expect to come to be, but never did, like the lack of a nurturing relationship with a parent, infertility, maybe even a sense of being safe in the world as a result of trauma. But equally important to understand is where does grief go, meaning what does it impact? And I think we'll, we can all agree that grief impacts our emotional well-being, even if we incorrectly try to limit the range of feelings to a very small category. But grief actually impacts our whole selves. That includes our cognitive, our physical, our spiritual, and our relational well-being. The most important thing to remember is wherever your grief comes from, it will impact all domains of your life. The fourth W is when, when do we grieve? And honestly, the question I'm asked most often, when does grief end? Since we experience multiple losses at multiple times in our lives, we actually grieve across the lifespan. We can even begin grieving months or years after a loss. Maybe we weren't ready to face it. Maybe we didn't have the right kind of support in our lives. Maybe we hadn't even recognized it as loss until now. As for the question of when does grief end, contrary to the myth of our single story of grief, it doesn't end, per se. Grief just transforms, and we're actually transformed by it. The most important thing for you to remember is that grief becomes a part of your story. It's not your whole story though I know it can feel that way in the beginning. Now our final W is why. Why do we grieve? And I think the metaphor and the other Ws helped us see why. We humans are storytellers. That's deeply rooted in our neurobiology. We need stories to feel safe, to feel connected, to make meaning in our lives, and to thrive. So why do we grieve? Well, because a fundamental part of our manuscript has been torn to shreds. I wish I'd known about the five W's of grief when Eric died, and I suffered unnecessarily for years because my grief didn't look like I thought it should. I wish I'd known about my grief sooner so that I could have better supported our young daughter, the clients in my early social work career, the friends who lost parents and children during that time. But now I do know, and more importantly, so do all of you. But knowing is just the first step, so before I leave here today, how about we practice your newfound grief literacy by returning to the theater one last time. This time I want you to imagine that you're holding your very own manuscript. Maybe it's torn a bit, 
Maybe it's even completely shredded because you've recently experienced a loss. I want you to hold your manuscript and your heart with care. When you're ready, you're going to write what you know. Uh, you'll set it down when you need to, but you'll revisit it often. I suggest you invite a friend or a therapist to help you recall what you know and to help you discover if your emerging story includes unhelpful thoughts or harmful dialogue. Lastly, I want you to take a moment and look around this room. I'm serious. Take a moment. Look around the room. Yeah. Everyone you see has their own torn or shredded manuscript to rewrite. So set down your expectations. Let go of the idea you owe the other actors anything. Remember, there's no date for opening call. There's no lines for you to memorize. There's nothing for you to perform. There's just you, kindly, patiently, compassionately, rewriting your manuscript, your emerging story, one that includes the memories, the values, the love, and the meaning you're making of what you've lost. Thank you.